run the laboratory for aging research at the University of New South Wales. So welcome to Modern Healthspan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. So Dr. Wu, could you introduce the aging research lab and kind of what it is that you focus on? Yeah, look, we're a research lab at the University of New South Wales, and we aim to understand the molecular causes of biological aging, the focus in particular on changes in cell metabolism that occur with aging and whether that could be you know, a, a route to improve uh, healthy lifespan and potentially uh, extend overall lifespan. And we have a particular interest in female fertility as one of the first signs of biological aging. You recently, you, NMN, or at least NAD precursors, is one of the uh, elements that you look at, I believe. So, and you recently performed a study and then wrote a paper on the impact of the gut microbiome on NAD. So a host microbiome interaction in nicotinamide mononucleotide deamidation. But you also looked at NR, I think. So could you talk a little bit about that paper? I mean, what did you do? And uh, kind of what were the outcomes that you saw? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide or NAD is a redox cofactor. It's very important for uh, our cells metabolism and its levels seem to decline with age. And this is, as many of your uh, audience would already know, this is an extremely popular topic in aging research. There's lots of people looking at it, for example, providing NAD precursors such as nicotinamide riboside or nicotinamide mononucleotide for um, improving late life health. And so we had this interest around how uh, these precursors were metabolized in the body, because there are some mysteries about it. You know, we have this canonical view of how NAD is synthesized based on pathways that were discovered, you know, mostly in the 1950s. But, uh, you know, there are some parts of NAD metabolism that really don't quite make sense. Um, for example, NR or NMN, when delivered orally, cause a big increase in what we call deamidated. Uh, precursors. So these are NAD precursors that are on a different arm of NAD biosynthesis. Now, at least in mammals, we actually don't have an enzyme that allows these enzyme, these uh, precursors to cross between those pathways. And so the big mystery is how this is happening. And so, you know, we took the idea that maybe bacteria living in our gut who do have enzymes that can allow for this switch between these pathways, maybe they could be uh, mediating the switch between what we call amidated precursors. So for example, NR and NMN, and these what we call deamidated precursors on the different arm of NAD biosynthesis. So you labeled some NMN and, and NR, right? You use both? Correct? Just NMN. Just NMN. Okay. Yeah. So, so you labeled some NMN and uh, you fed it to, to the mice. Could you talk about what you saw when you did that? Um, I mean, if you yeah. want to share your screen, you could do that and uh, that might make it a bit clearer. Absolutely. So... It's worth actually just going back and talking about what we mean when we say labeling. Oh, yeah. True. So, <laughs> so uh, we use uh, isotope labels of NMN. And mm. so it's, it's very clear, it's, it's very important to, to clarify, these are not radioactive labels. So this is where, for example, a carbon atom, this carbon atom just here, for example, mm. has an extra neutron. So it, rather than being carbon-12, as you know, about 99% of carbon is in our world, it's carbon-13. And carbon-13 is naturally occurring. It's, uh, it's stable uh, and non-radioactive, but it does weigh a little bit more and we can weigh that on a mass spectrometer. Similarly, uh, something like nitrogen uh, normally has a molecular mass of, an atomic mass of 14. So we use an isotope, so now it weighs 15. So we have this machine called a mass spectrometer and that allows us to um, weigh these molecules. And so we can tell by following that extra shift in molecular mass, whether that, uh, 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 molecule has incorporated the label. And so what we did is we uh, actually generated these NAD, uh, these isotopes of NMN, actually uh, from uh, collaborators in Hong Kong, where you are right now, who, um, where we had these labels at very specific positions. And the idea here was to see whether NMN was getting into what we call the deamidated arm of NAD biosynthesis. So apologies, this sort of starts to get a bit detailed, but let's just kind of walk through it slowly. If that's all right with you, Richard. Yes. So uh, this is uh, NMN, the molecular structure of NMN. So here you've got a phosphate. This is a ribose, and this is a nicotinamide ring. And what we've done is put a label on the nitrogen atom here in the nicotinamide ring and on the ribose. And if NMN goes into NAD the way it should, you know, the canonical pathway, uh, NMN will go into NAD and you, see, you will see all of those labels that are incorporated. 
So that's the canonical pathway, and that's what we expect. Now, the big mystery in the field was the fact that when you give NMN, you see a surprising increase in NAMN, nicotinic acid mononucleotide, and nicotinic acid adenine dinucleotide. And uh, for the keen, eye, the keen eyes in the audience, the only difference between these two structures is this nitrogen here. So this is what we call an amidated precursor for the nitrogen is now an oxygen. So this is a carboxylic acid. So this is the nicotinic acid group. So, you know, that's a big question. How do you go from an amide to a, a carboxylic acid or a nicotinamide to a nicotinic acid? Now there's been previous work in the field showing that nicotinamide on its own can go to nicotinic acid as a result of the gut microbiome. Uh, and this, uh, you know, the, the question we had is whether the gut microbiome could also do this to NMN, whether it could swap out this nitrogen for an oxygen. There were some very old papers from the 1970s that suggest that maybe there is an enzyme in mammals that could, uh, in particular in the liver, that could do mediate this deamidation. We haven't really seen much since then, so we don't know what that enzyme is. But there is a very well-characterized bacterial enzyme that can convert NMN to NAMN. And of course, when, when we um, deliver these precursors orally, it has to pass through the gut microbiome. So that was our big question for this study. So the, the basic study design here is we give this isotope label of NMN. And if it is going into NAMN, we also deliver at the same time glutamine. Now, uh, taking a step back, this is what we call deamidated or de novo pathway, uh, or also called priest handler pathway for NAD biosynthesis. The last uh, step before getting into NAD is this species nicotinic acid adenine dinucleotide. Now to go from here to here, you can see the only difference between these structures is that oxygen finally going back to a nitrogen. And that nitrogen comes from a glutamine. So that's an amino acid that's quite abundant in our bodies. And so what we did is give a version of glutamine that also has an isotope label. So it's a 15N nitrogen. So that one atom, that one nitrogen is labeled. And so the idea was, if we give this version of NMN, it should have a mass shift, as in it's got, um, it weighs six extra mass units. Uh, that's what we mean by M plus six, as a result of these carbon-13 and N15 atoms. Uh, so if it's now gone by this pathway, it should also incorporate a nitrogen from this glutamine. So that should actually result in an extra shift, and it should go to M plus seven. And so the idea is what we wanted to look for is NAD that was still in its um, standard form as M plus six, so that's NA NMN going into NAD via the standard canonical route, or NAD that's got an M plus seven label. And we will know from this scheme that this had to have incorporated an extra label from this glutamine, meaning that NMN has actually gone via this uh, deaminated or um, de novo route into NAD by synthesis. Um, so that was the, the basic uh, experimental design. Jump in if you have any questions at this point, Richard, but we actually have a, a, a very similar scheme over here on the right. Mm. So this was designed to be completely complementary, a separate experiment, but uh, ideally uh, addressing the same question. And this is where the NMN that we started with had one of these isotope labels on this amide group right here, this nitrogen atom. Mm. And so the idea was if it was going into NAD by the standard group, it would still have that label. So the whole thing starts off as M plus seven, so seven extra mass units from those labels. And you should see NAD that also has those seven mass units. So that's the standard route is what we'd expect. But if it was going via this different route and this uh, nitrogen was being removed, we should only see an M plus six by the time it actually gets into NAD. Mm -hmm. uh, and sure enough, um, uh, you know, the, I guess there's a couple of uh, questions here. One is, does the scheme work at all? And so I might just um, slot down to the one question there. Uh, so that does imply that you would expect that NMN is being absorbed whole, whether it's deamidated or not, yeah. rather than going through like NR or being broken down further. That is a great question. So we, um, you know, one of the questions in it, or one of the uh, issues in NAD biology is how NMN gets into a cell. Now, there are two competing theories. One is that NMN is uh, transported directly into the cell intact via a transporter. The other is that NMN, in fact, loses this phosphate group and goes back to NR, and that it's NR that gets inside the cell and is then rephosphorylated to form NMN. 
as I'll get to later on, mm. I, as a result of this paper, I tend to favor this latter hypothesis that NMN is going to NR before it gets mm. uh, converted into back into NMN. But ultimately, we actually couldn't tell uh, when we look at these results, whether right. it's NMN or NR that's being deaminated. We haven't set that right. scheme up to, uh, to figure that out. Yeah. You could, we could do that in the future by also putting a label on this phosphate group. Mm -hmm. and that would allow us to, to, tell, tell, to tell whether it was getting into the cell intact. Um, and the other issue that you raise is, you know, how it gets into the cell or whether it's getting it intact. You know, forgetting just this phosphate group here, whether it's going to NMN, from NMN to NR, the bigger question that I'll get to later on is whether even NR is getting into the cell intact or this bond here between the uh, nicotinamide group and the ribose is broken down and we're just getting nicotinamide into the body. So I, I can get to that a bit later on, right. but those are excellent questions and we'll, we'll get back to those throughout the, um, the story. This month, I've got some great news to share with you. The Bioptimizer's Black Friday mega sale has already started. Rather than just a weekend, it's happening through the entire month of November. This mega deal is available only for our listeners with our code MODERN10. The mega deal includes great discounts on all Bioptimizer products. On top of Magnesium Breakthrough, my wife is a huge fan of their digestive products. She is taking Mass Science and Gluten Guardian to optimize her digestion of carbs, proteins, and even gluten or casein. There are also new products for sleep, gut, and brain health as well. All products are backed with a 365-day money-back guarantee. Now it's time to put your health at the top of the Black Friday wish list. The biggest discount you can get and amazing gifts are available only on our page, bioptimizers.com slash modern, with the code MODERN10 throughout November. Thank you for your support. So look, the, you know, the first experiment we did actually was in uh, hepatocytes grown in a dish. So these are just uh, liver cells outside of an animal that are grown in a petri dish. And importantly, they don't have a microbiome attached at this point, right? So it's not like giving something orally and then having the, that uh, NMN go through the gut microbiome. This is instead just these liver cells grown in a dish, no bacteria. And we're just looking to see if the scheme kind of is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Look, the, I know there's a lot of data in this paper. This is one of our biggest challenges to express all these data. But remember, the, the idea was that if we're seeing um, NMN going into NAD via the standard route, we'd have N plus 6 going to N plus 6. Or if it was going via this um, deaminated route, we'd have N plus 6 actually going into N plus 7 when we had this glutamine here. Now, the interesting one was that uh, even in this first experiment, this, which is only set up to you know, see if the scheme is doing what we thought it would do, there was in fact a small amount of, <laughs> that's pretty difficult to see here, there was in fact a small amount of um, NAD that was formed via this deaminated route. And that is kind of not what we had expected. So mm -hmm. it is in fact possible that there is a small amount of deamidation that occurs uh, in mammalian cells. Now, again, there were these papers in the 1970s suggesting that there is an NMN deamidase, an, an, an enzyme that can convert NMN uh, into nicotinic acid mononucleotide or NAMN. Apologize for these uh, abbreviations, uh, all sounding fairly similar, mm -hmm. but it is. Uh, so there, there was a, an evidence for a small amount of that occurring. But regardless, the scheme is sort of doing what we had expected it to do. On your question mm -hmm. just now about whether it's going in as NR or NMN, so we saw um, the expected labeling pattern of NMN, but we also saw that uh, identical labeling pattern for NR. But because we don't have that extra label on the phosphate, we don't know whether it's um, you know, being had that phosphate removed before it got into the cell. Uh, okay, so what we what we did, you know, to get to this question of whether um, whether the gut microbiome played a role in this deamidation reaction, what we actually did is treated mice, and I have to emphasize to everyone in your audience: these are just mice. This is a mouse experiment. And a mouse is not a human. But we treated mice with antibiotics for a period of time. And the idea is that the antibiotics would wipe out the gut microbiome. And these uh, colorful plots here are um, bacterial diversity. So each different color happens to be a different, uh, uh, different species of bacteria. Uh, and you know, the antibiotics are roughly doing what they're supposed to be doing. So they're, they're wiping out the gut microbiome. There's less bacteria in general, there's less bacterial DNA. 
And there's only really one species that, um, that survives being treated with antibiotics in small amounts. So we're fairly confident that, um, you know, we have effectively got knocked out the gut microbiome. Okay, so here's the core result um, that I will zoom in on. Okay, so when we give um, NMN that has the N plus six label, so this is the, the labeling scheme right here, plus that glutamine to animals that have been treated with or without antibiotics. Remember, if it's going via this deaminated route, we would see more of this and less of this. Okay, so we do see this uh, being formed in mice, but when we treat them with antibiotics, this goes down. So what we're looking at here is the ratio between this species and this version of NAD. And the bars here in green and purple are animals that are untreated versus those that were treated with antibiotics. Uh, and so in fact, we, we think we, we, and we're, here we're looking at uh, gut tissue. We're seeing a reduction in the formation of the um, deaminated species, or sorry, the NAD that's gone by the deaminated route mm -hmm. when we treat with antibiotics. When we also look at uh, nicotinamide, so this is when NAD, when NAD is broken down, uh, it forms nicotinamide and that can be recycled back into fresh NAD. And so again, because of this labeling scheme, we can look for both species. So if NAD has gone through this deamidation uh, route uh, or nicotinamide has gone through this deamidated route, you would expect the formation of this species here, which has incorporated that extra label. Uh, and, you know, there's a striking reduction in the formation of that uh, when you treat it with antibiotics. Now, it's also important to emphasize at this point that, you know, it's already been shown that the gut microbiome can convert nicotinamide into nicotinic acid. Um, so this kind of gets in, a bit into the weeds, but, you know, we've known about vitamin B3 for decades and decades. In fact, since the, uh, you know, it was in the 1930s that we first figured out that um, a deficiency in these two species called, caused this severe condition called pellagra, uh, which was, you know, once upon a time rampant across the United States, uh, Southern states. So it could, and you know, it could be that nicotinamide is simply first being converted into nicotinic acid, uh, as described in previous results. Um, but the counter argument against that, uh, which I'll switch to is something that's hidden in the um, supplementary data is that we saw almost no nicotinic acid with or without a label in any of these experiments. So nicotinic acid is present at much lower levels than nicotinamide. Um, that's kind of important because when we think about our niacin uh, recommendation, recommended, recommended daily intake, you know, the food intake guidelines that are provided by government, uh, they specify sort of uh, this uh, composite of both nicotinamide and nicotinic acid. And sort of there's this, um, it can be really confusing to read the literature when people talk about vitamin B3 or niacin or niacin equivalents, they can kind of mean uh, nicotinamide or nicot and nicotinic acid or just nicotinic acid. You know, sometimes it's both. Um, and that starts to really get confusing. But I guess the reason I bring this up is I don't think that they are the same, that they have the similar properties. Uh, I think at least in mammals, um, nicotinamide is metabolized more efficiently than nicotinic acid. Having said that, nicotinic acid is actually a, um, an FDA-approved drug for treating cardiovascular disease. So this is a drug called Niaspan. Do we know any, do we know anything about the species of mi of microbe that is doing this, or like we yeah. think most of them do it? Great question. So I guess that's the next study, right? Oh, okay. um, so the enzyme that converts NMN to NAMN is called PNCC. Um, and of course, most um, microbial work is performed in E. coli just because they're easy to grow in the lab. And that's sort of a challenge with microbiome uh, work that not all species grow well in a lab. Mm -hmm. So at this point, no, we don't. Um, mm -hmm. You know, PNCC and PNCA are both uh, fairly conserved um, across bacteria. Um, and PNCA, we've definitely known about for a very long time. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it, it could be any one of a number or could be that's right one. yeah that's okay. right you know we we have been looking at the impact of um nmn treatment on the microbiome or the microbial microbiome makeup mm -hmm. uh, and there are some very 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 small number of species that do change um 
However, we're unsure of the actual significance of that. Uh, and I don't think that you can infer causality between one species being more abundant um, mm. and that, you know, the efficiency of NMN deamidation. I guess they're probably going to be two separate things. Right. But when you remove the microbiome, you also saw like higher levels of NAD or NMN yeah. in, in, the, in the mice. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. So this is the really confusing part. And uh, I apologize for the enormous um, volume of data <laughs> <in> these figures. <laughs> but look, um, uh, it's almost impossible to show on, on a Zoom screen. But uh, if we look here at NAD, so the first bar is, mm. so we're looking at here at unlabeled NAD. So no label incorporation at all, right? But we remember we give 100% isotope labeled NMN. All right. So the first bar here is completely untreated. And the second bar has received um, uh, antibiotics alone. So no NMN, still no isotope treatment. But even just with the antibiotics alone, there's more NAD. And we had not expected to see that. Uh, so in fact, there's more NMN, there's more NAD, there's more nicotinamide. It's really quite a surprising thing. There also, there is less NAMN. Now these two species, nicotinic acid mononucleotide and uh, nicotinic acid adenine dinucleotide, I have to emphasize were present at much lower overall quantities. Uh, but yeah, this is the, was the biggest surprise, or not the biggest surprise, but this was a surprise from the paper that the microbiome um, or treating with antibiotics alone increased the total quantities of even unlabeled material. Uh, and I might actually just skip to a, a different version the second experiment here, just because there's fewer mm. bars to look at. Uh, but there, you know, this is showing a similar thing. So uh, the first bar here, untreated. The second bar, antibiotics alone. The next bar is the uh, isotope labeled NMN. The next bar is the isotope labeled NMN plus antibiotics. Okay, sorry, there's lots going on. Mm. Uh, they're just overwhelming figures. All right, so NAD is up with antibiotics. NMN is up with antibiotics. Nicotinamide is up with antibiotics. Uh, even uh, in the unlabeled version. Now, when we give our uh, isotope labels, of course, we expect to, uh, we don't really expect to see any of these isotope labeled materials in the absence of giving the isotope. So we don't expect to see NAD labeling without an isotope. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, of course, what we see. And then here's the NAD uh, with the isotope and then NAD with the isotope plus antibiotics. So again, uh, antibiotics seem to have increased the proportion or the amount of uh, isotope labeling for NAD. Uh, so this is NAD that's, um, that's been broken down prior to incorporation. We know that because we can see whether the label is on the nicotinamide ring or on the nicotinamide ring plus the ribose group. And that gets to that question you had about whether it's intact. And in every circumstance, we can see that it's up with antibiotics. And so the idea we kind of came to is that um, the gut microbiome probably enjoys uh, being exposed to NAD precursors. You know, bacteria use this, you know, need NAD just like humans. Uh, and when they see these NAD precursors being given orally, they probably, <laughs> like, thank you very much, we'll take a lot of that before you get to see it. And so when there's no microbiome there, uh, one of the ideas we had from this paper is that potentially uh, more of those NAD precursors can get into uh, the gut can get ac across the um, gut membrane and into the body. Now, having said that, that's um, that's an interesting facet of NAD biology. I'm not sure that it has huge clinical implications. Mm. What I definitely want to make clear is that people shouldn't go out and take uh, antibiotics to increase their uptake of NAD precursors. But it kind of is interesting, uh, mm. uh, an interesting facet of NAD. Look, I, I guess the um, you know the last one that I'll just get onto because mm. you, know, you mentioned it. Earlier this whole question of how any NMN gets into the cell. Mm. So, you know, I said earlier, there are these two ideas and this is a much better illustration. So, you know, uh, one idea is that NMN is just taken up directly by this transporter. And the other idea is that NMN is uh, first uh, converted into NR, nicotinamide riboside, outside of the cell. So that phosphate gets taken off and then NR gets taken up into the cell and then gets re reconverted or phosphor rephosphorylated back into NMN. So those are the two models. Um, now, from the data we have here, I think that the second like model is far more likely. Mm -hmm. um, so this, in this, the idea here is that we compare 
the proportion of either NMN or NR that has a label. So if NMN is taken up direct, uh, into the cell, we would expect to see lots of labeling of NMN. If NR was taken up into the cell, sorry, if NMN was first converted into NR and then taken up into the cell, we would expect to see more labeling of NR. So when we look at the data, what has the greater degree of labeling, NMN or NR? And the data are very clear. This is NMN labeling and this is NR labeling. Mm. Yeah. And that to, to me says that NR uh, uh, is, the, is the intermediate for NMN uptake. Now, I, again, I do want to emphasize, however, that it, it doesn't mean that these um, precursors are exactly equal. Uh, I, you know, we actually need to, or are in the process of running these experiments, but um, it's likely that NMN has different, uh, what we call PK, pharmacokinetic properties to NR which is to say how well it's taken up, where it's transported across the body, which tissues it gets into. Um, you know, NMN versus NR are not identical in that regard. And, you know, the, the other big question we had uh, from all of this work is that, and actually let me just go back to these data, <laughs> these incredibly overwhelming data, and again, I apologize. Um, you know, the majority quantitatively, you know, if you look at the y-axis here, on the units. Okay, so this is unlabeled NAD and then NAD that's only got the label on the nicotinamide ring. So you can see, you know, 400 versus 200. But then when we get to the, the double label, so the label on both the ribose and the nicotinamide, you know, you've only got uh, four here, 20 here. So quite low numbers by comparison. So, you know, one uh, floor of this study that we discussed is that we took tissues too late. When you look at um, how, how quickly uh, NAD turnover occurs in the body in an animal. Um, it actually occurs in some, some tissues quite rapidly. Uh, for example, in the gut, it happens, uh, I think within uh, 20 minutes or so, I'll have to double check the number, but it can happen uh, relatively rapidly. So we waited a couple of hours after giving NMN. So it's likely that within that couple of hours, uh, actually, sorry, four hours after giving NMN, it's likely that if NA, it was incorporated into NAD, it's probably been turned over. So that probably mm -hmm. explains why we don't see as much intact incorporation. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, one thing that I've always been uh, surprised by, and we are uh, actually running some of these experiments right now, uh, is a direct comparison between nicotinamide, you know, that old school, very cheap vitamin uh, cofactor that's added to foods, and NR or NMN. Because, you know, there are actually a surprisingly small number of papers that have compared these and they don't have similar properties, right? Mm -hmm. And if NR or NMN were truly entirely being broken down into just plain nicotinamide, you would expect that, uh, you know, there should be no difference between giving NR or NMN or mm -hmm. just plain nicotinamide. But I think mm -hmm. that they are not the same and we need to trace that. So that's, you know, where we are at now. So would you consider these results kind of specific to NMN, right? Um, I, I guess they, yeah. they, they would not really apply to NR, or they may or may not. We, we really don't. They may or may not. We weren't able to tell the difference in this paper based on the design of the isotope. Um, you know, there, uh, there was a paper uh, two years ago, I think from a uh, Korean group, if my memory serves, that showed that a... Um, Actually, an enzyme present in mammals called BST1 could convert NR into nicotinic acid riboside, NAR. Um, so yeah, that was, um, was an enzyme called BST1 that's present on the outside of the cell. I should add that we, we're still interested in this question of the crossover between these traditional pathways of NAD synthesis, mm -hmm. the recycling route, so NMA, uh, nicotinamide to NMN to NAD, and the uh, de novo or Chris Handler route from you know, nicotinic acid, NAMN, NAAD, NAD. Mm -hmm. Again, apologies for the acronyms. Um, aside from the microbiome, we ha do have some additional data that we're you know, in the process of writing up that looks at a different cell surface enzyme that we think can also mediate this reaction, this, uh, this interconversion. Uh, are you thinking of looking at uh, kind of intravenous NMN or NR? Um, no, so, um, uh, you know, there are one of the um, popular, mainstream popular uh, trends has been intravenous NAD infusions. Mm -hmm. So this is whole NAD. 
Yeah. Um, I'm based in Sydney, and uh, just north of me is uh, Bondo Beach, which of course is a glamorous place full of glamorous people who like to pursue alternative lifestyles. And you know, there's an NAD infusion clinic there. Uh, so I think this is uh, not a great idea. So NAD is not pr normally present outside of the cell, right? So if you're infusing it intravenously, that's not where it's supposed to be for starters. Secondly, it's not going to get into the cells intact, right? Uh, it's just too big and too bulky, a char highly charged molecule to actually get into cells. It has to first be broken down. The second is that, uh, you know, we're looking at, um, obviously, NMN is uh, undergoing development as a uh, pharmaceutical, as a, as a drug. And that's entirely looking at oral dosing. Right.